Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Council of Trent podcast. I'm your host, Catholic Answers apologist and speaker, Trent Horn. And today we have a special guest. We have senior apologist, Jimmy Aiken. He's going to talk to us a little bit about his recent debate with Bart Ehrman. And they debated the question, uh, are the Gospels unreliable? Uh, and so and that's important, the exact prompt of the resolution that we'll get to there. So before we do that, though, just a reminder, please consider supporting us at trenthornpodcast.com. Uh, also, I have a new course on the existence of God at our School of Apologetics. Go to schoolofapologetics.com. You can check out my course on the existence of God. Jimmy has a lot of great courses on there as well. You definitely want to check out. So, Jimmy, welcome back. Thank you, Trent. Nice to be here. Well, let's talk a little bit then about uh, this debate. When I heard that you were going to be debating Bart Ehrman, I was stoked because I've read about Bart Ehrman, obviously, for a very long time. He's been writing on Christianity for a while. Why don't you tell our audience a little bit more about who Ehrman is? And then I really want to dig down into your, your debate prep, because, I mean, I do debates a lot as well. And when I do prep, well, never mind. I'm going to throw it out there, and then you can just play with all this, that if I were debating Ehrman, I'd be excited and nervous. And I would think to myself, well, I've read a lot of his stuff in the past, but when I debate someone, I, I let them live in my head for about a month. I read their books, watch their videos. So like I know his stuff, but I would just be going back, lock down, read his stuff, watch his videos, get him reacquainted in my head because he's a, a smart and affable guy. So tell us a little more about Bart and what went into your your prep for this. OK, so uh, Bart is um, is a uh, uh, scholar of of the New Testament. He was raised Anglican, but then when he was in, I gather, his teenage years, he had a um, conversion experience and became a uh, born again Christian. Um, he went to Moody, uh, the Moody Bible Institute, and later, which is a very conservative uh, school, often described as a fundamentalist school, where Bible, where Bible is our middle name. Indeed, <laughs> um, at Moody Bible Institute, Institute. yeah, and um, and so he had a background as a conservative evangelical. He ended up going to some very prestigious universities and getting a doctorate, and became an expert, among other things, in the um, uh, in textual criticism of the New Testament. Uh, that's the science by which people look at manuscripts and try to figure out the original readings of the texts. Um, he, over time, began to um, come to the view that there are errors in the Bible, and that didn't initially destroy his Christian faith. There are Christians who are errantists, meaning they think the Bible contains errors, and he was one of those for many years, although he did ultimately uh, lose his faith, and today he, I gather, describes himself as an, as a sort of agnostic, as, as an atheist-leaning agnostic. He's written a bunch of uh, books with major publishers that have, uh, I mean, he would say these are just bringing ideas from mainstream biblical scholarship to the people. A lot of others, though, is, including various evangelicals and Catholics, have said, okay, you're bringing a certain current uh, from the scholarly world to public attention, but there are other scholars who disagree. And, <laughs> and so, it, so they would like to see a little bit more balance. Yeah, and, and when I see his books, and you can get your thoughts on this, What's hard about Bart Ehrman is that a lot of his scholarly work is very nuanced and mm -hmm. it can be very helpful in understanding the history of Christianity. His books like Forgery and Counterforgery, or he did a book with uh, Brutz Metzger on the textual transmission of the New Testament. And in there, he talks about how you could reconstruct it almost from the church fathers and um, that it was actually transmitted well. But then when Ehrman writes his popular level books, mm -hmm. things like misquoting Jesus, they tend to have a much more alarming themes and proposals, or at least the way the books are marketed to make it seem like things are more in doubt than they are. Whereas with his scholarly stuff, it's very nuanced with his most famous book is probably misquoting Jesus, uh, which talks about textual criticism for a lay person to understand. What's funny is I believe that his publisher he wanted to call it lost in transmission about the corruption of the biblical text. 
uh, but his publisher thought that sound too much like a car book. So they called it misquoting Jesus, even though these textual issues don't have anything to do with what Jesus said. So it seems like, I don't know if you have a comment on this. I feel like he has a lot of great scholarly stuff, but sometimes it can be a bit overblown or alarmist in the things that he communicates to a popular audience. Yeah, so he's he's definitely more careful in his scholarly work than in his popular work, which is to be expected. I sure. mean, in a, in a scholarly work, you've got to get in all the qualifications, whereas in a popular work, if you got in all the qualifications, people's eyes would glaze over and they'd stop reading you. So you, you have to be less nuanced in a popular work than you would be writing for scholars. But I do think that he does, in his popular work, have more of a glass is half empty approach where he sounds more skeptical of things than he does in his scholarly work. Mm-hmm. And that's something that others have pointed out as well. But that's a, these, these days he, uh, he teaches in uh, North Carolina, and uh, that's a basic sketch of who Bard is. Okay. Well, let's talk then about uh, the debate and your preparation that was involved in it. So how yeah. did that come about? Tell mm-hmm. us why the particular resolution was selected and just i just love nerding out about debate prep like what what you um did for all that well in terms of how the debate came about uh years ago um john Sorensen, our director of operations and i were talking about it and he asked if i'd be willing to debate bart and i said sure someday you know that that'd be fine and he brought it up again um number of months ago and wondered if I was still interested and I was. And so he, um, he checked with Bart and we worked out, uh, the format and the resolution and the resolution was resolved. The gospels are historically unreliable. And the reason that we proposed that was because normally it's the other way around normally. Um, so in a conversation, I guess I should talk about the burden of proof first. In a conversation, the person who shoulders the burden of proof is the person who wants you to change your opinion. If I want you to change your opinion, then I need to give you evidence for why you should do that. So I have the burden of proof. On the other hand, if you want to convince me to change my opinion, then you need to give me evidence for why I should do that. And you have the burden of proof. In a debate, though, uh, the burden of proof is a matter of form, and it's assigned to whoever agrees with the debate resolution. And normally, in debates on the reliability of the Gospels, uh, the burden of proof is is assigned to the believer. The believer has to prove these documents are historically reliable. But that's only looking at the question from one side. And every question needs to be looked at from both sides. And so I think it's healthy once in a while for the skeptic to have the burden of proof. I mean, I already believe in the Gospels. If you think I shouldn't, well, then tell me why. You get the burden of proof this time. And I know Bart was uh, somewhat reluctant to do that uh, resolution, but he, to his credit, he was willing to do it. And so I think it was a uh, productive, healthy exchange. Um, do you think though, and I think this came up in the debate, um, which is helpful. It is a little bit difficult though. And you, you covered this well in the debate about defining terms. It really does come down to what you mean by reliable. And you made a good job of contrasting that with being inerrant, that something could be reliable, even if it did not meet the definition of inerrant. Maybe you could explain that more. Sure. So inerrancy means not having any errors. And a document would be inerrant if it contains no errors. Like if you score 100% on a math test, you have an inerrant math test. And uh, as a matter of faith, um, Christians believe that the Gospels, or many Christians believe that the Gospels are inerrant. There are, there are less nuanced views of how inerrancy works, and then there are more nuanced views of how it works. And the Catholic Church has a more nuanced view. Um, but reliability is not the same thing as inerrancy. Uh, We have people we know that, you know, let's say friends that we consider reliable friends, we can count on them. But if they make just one mistake, they're not inerrant. And yet, we wouldn't say that our friend who makes a tiny handful of mistakes is fundamentally unreliable. Um, He is reliable the vast majority of the time. And really, reliability is a spectrum. 
that goes between 100% and 0%. But we don't have a way without a time machine of going back to the first century and checking out what percentage of the time are the Gospels reliable. And so if we're going to make a judgment about are they reliable, and we're going to make that on historical grounds, we can't just use a percentage. We need to do something else. And so what I proposed in my opening remarks was that we can look at the major claims that a document makes, the intermediate claims that it makes, and then the minor detailed claims that it makes. And if we can show that it's it's regularly reliable on those, we can verify a bunch of major, intermediate, and minor claims that a, a document makes, then we can judge that it's historically reliable until such time as we're shown that it has enough errors in it to counterbalance that. And so that was sort of the first half of my opening statement, framing the issue in terms of, look, we're not talking about inerrancy, we're talking about reliability, and here's what I propose as a test for reliability. And what was helpful here is that you showed, you know, because <clears throat> that would be very hard. One reason I would be hesitant to want to take on a burden like showing the Gospels are reliable is that you have a very large target area. You know, you've got lots of evidence you'd have to muster in a short 15 minutes. But I thought you brilliantly did this in, efficient, in an efficient way by pointing out all of the facts the Gospels propose that Ehrman agrees are true. And so that was just a quick and easy way to do that. And maybe that tied in a little bit with how you prepared for this debate. So you can tell us more about that. Yeah. So anytime I'm preparing to debate someone, um, I, I do my homework. In Bart's case, I, I already had a number of his books and I got a few more. And I watched uh, multiple debates that he did because he's debated this subject before. And so I watched all of his gospel reliability debates that I could find, and I learned the arguments that he uses and the objections that he brings up. I also watched some related debates that were not exactly on gospel reliability, but were kind of adjacent to that. And so I, I studied um, his thought very carefully. And one of the things that I, I noticed certain things about the debates that he did, and they were with evangelicals for the most part on gospel reliability. Um, and I, I, I tried to learn from what the other debaters were doing and looking for ways to improve the situation. One of the things I would see other debaters doing is they would try to defend the historical reliability of the Gospels from the ground up. And what I mean by that is they would, they would make the case f sort of from scratch, like, well, who wrote the Gospels? How long after they were, after the events were they written? Uh, what evidence do we have that they were in a position to have this information? What about Jesus? Um, what, uh, it, they would they would take this sort of external approach, and the problem is that would chew up all their time, you know, in 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 talking about who wrote what and when and how accurate are they and you know what confirmatory evidence do we have? They're getting into the weeds on trying to prove the reliability of the gospels, and it's great if you're writing a book to do that. That's wonderful, but if you've got a twenty minute opening statement that's going to just consume your time, and it's, you're not going to make an effective case in that amount of time. And Bart can then just rely on the fact that you've only j sketched a very general case that he can then object to and say, well, I don't think this person wrote it, and I don't think it was this early, and things like that. Although he's generally pretty good about letting someone have the dates they prefer. But um, I realized, well, look, Bart agrees that the Gospels are right about a bunch of stuff. And so let's use that. Uh, so I, I did research and I identified around, I only, I used 62 of them in the uh, debate itself. There was a 63rd <laughs> that I eliminated at the last minute because he could quibble with it. But I actually had like around 70 things that he agrees the Gospels are right about. And they, I divided them into major, intermediate, and minor claims. And so in the second half of my opening statement, I, I said, well, you know, uh, here are a bunch of major, intermediate, and minor claims that the Gospels make. 
I don't have time to give you, you know, detailed evidence for each one of them. But fortunately, we've got Bart here and Bart agrees. And so I had to make it visual for the audience. I had green check marks that I would add. I would read through the propositions and say, Bart agrees with this. Bart agrees with this. He thinks this is right. He thinks this is right. And and after going through all 62 items, I put up a big um, a slide with all these green check marks, you know, on big ones for major claims, inter- slightly smaller ones for intermediate claims, and small green check marks for um, for minor claims. And I say, so we've seen that the Gospels are frequently right. Bart himself admits the Gospels are frequently right about major, intermediate, and minor things that they say. So we're entitled to view the Gospels as historically reliable until such time as we've been shown enough errors to counterbalance that. And I then had another slide with a few red check, red uh, X's on it, um, representing errors that Bart had proposed. Now, he hadn't proposed very many, um, and actually I had more red check marks than he had proposed errors, but it was still a small number, and I pointed out this is a small number of errors Bart's proposed, and they, they aren't major. None of them are major. At most, they're intermediate, and many of them are on minor details, like did this happen on Passover or the day after Passover? And uh, or or the day before Passover, it's a difference of a day. That's a that's a minor right. matter of detail. Um, and I said, well, even if you grant that these errors are errors, and I don't think they are, and we can talk about that. But even if you grant them all, this small number of red X's does not counterbalance this massive collection of green check marks. And so, Bart hasn't met the burden of proof. What do you think? I, I didn't notice this um, <clears throat> come up a lot in the debate. Maybe I missed that part. I was watching it on my phone. My kids are running around when it was streaming live. But I guess it, one uh, element I might have added in if I were up there, and it's always not great to speculate too much, what would you do? Mm-hmm. Um, how useful do you think it is to compare the Gospels to other ancient uh, documents that people like Ehrman would say are reliable? Like, I don't know, like the histories of Josephus or Tacitus or other ancient biographies, which, like, you read them, they do get minor things wrong. They, they do get things wrong or have contradictions, but we still use them to figure out what happened in that time period, so we call them reliable. How, do you think that's a useful argument to make those kind of parallels? In in general, yes, but not with Bart, because what Bart, what Bart will say is, oh, those aren't reliable either. Yeah, you could um, he, scorch earth it and just say there none of them are reliable. <laughs> well, and he he does something very much like that in in the debate that I did with him. He talks at one point in the, I, either the discussion or the question period. He asserts that ancient biographies in general are unreliable, mm-hmm. and um, and he's using a definition of reliability that's that's either clo- identical to or close to inerrant. So he doesn't mean we can't get useful historical information or that we shouldn't give the benefit of the doubt to a particular document. Um, but if I, if I brought up Josephus or Tacitus or um, uh, Plutarch or anybody like that and said, well, these guys are reliable, he would say, no, they're not. But then I feel like he's sawing off his own tree branch if he would end up doing that, because it seems like you could make this kind of argument that if all the if all primary, let's say for subject X, if all primary sources for X are unreliable, it seems like all the secondary sources would also be unreliable if all the primary sources are unreliable. And that would mean that is all modern scholarship of ancient history unreliable if the sources are? It seems like you would poison the whole well. In, uh, I think Bart would say we can know some things about history with great confidence, but others, uh, because of the state of the sources, we really can't know with confidence. And, mm-hmm. and as long as, as subst- from Bart's point of view, if we can't know something with confidence a substantial amount of the time, then we shouldn't call it reliable. And so I think he would probably say that a lot of our knowledge of ancient history is unreliable. Yeah, and I think because, that'll get, and, that get back to the definition of reliable then. Yeah. And, and because we we have these very limited amounts of time to discuss the issue together. I chose to keep the focus exclusively on the Gospels rather than broaden it. It's not my job in the debate to defend all of ancient literature, just the Gospels. Right. Yeah, so we'll talk because where you've set yourself up is, okay, we agree lots of stuff is reliable, 
The only way you could refute my case is if you show on like, imagine a, a seesaw, basically. Mm-hmm. It's like you've, you've or got scales. A, yeah, yeah. Or scales. I always like to think of two guys on a seesaw. You got a big guy sitting over here, 62 fa- major facts, pushing the seesaw down. It's like a 6,200 pound man or something. Then I, I'm going to need to get at least another 6,200 pound man over here. What are the errors you're going to propose? And it seems like he focused primarily on the infancy narratives of Jesus and the resurrection appearances of Jesus. Um, he also had a little bit on the preaching of Jesus. A little bit yeah. there too. So let's maybe you could say a little bit about how you engage those subjects. Let's start with the infancy narratives because I think a lot of people, when they bring up Bible contradictions, they'll often point to uh, this issue. Maybe you can talk about that. And then uh, the, probably the most interesting part of that discussion is the question of, you know, where did Mary and Joseph travel to and where were their homes? Uh, and you've written an article about that as well. I think that was a big part in talking about the infancy narratives. Yeah, so uh, people will variously uh, try to accuse the infancy narratives of having contradictions, and I've never found this plausible. If you if you look carefully, if you read them carefully, they fit together remarkably well. And so years ago, I wrote a post about how the accounts of Jesus's childhood or the infancy narratives, how they fit together, where I take the data from Matthew and Luke, where we have accounts of Jesus's childhood in the first two chapters, and I just sequence the material and show you how all this goes together. Um, in, in the debate, Bart, in the cross-examination period, Bart posed a particular challenge to me and said, well, um, Luke depicts... Um, Joseph is living in Nazareth, and then he goes to Bethlehem for the census. But in Matthew, Matthew, and and then he returns to to Nazareth. In Matthew, um, it depicts Joseph as living in Bethlehem, and only uh, later flying to Egypt and then coming back. And apparently, he's going to resume residence in Nazareth. But he, because he learns who the new ruler is, he's afraid of the new ruler, so he goes up to Nazareth instead. And how do you put those together? Because it sounds like they're the evangelists are um, are saying Joseph lived in these two different places. And so, in responding to that, I said, "Well, he did. He had two homes." And and Bart said, "That's an interesting thought. I hadn't." That hadn't occurred to me. And he then began to think about, well, what what would that involve and how plausible is it? Like, would a working class guy like Joseph actually um, be able to afford two homes? And how common was that in the ancient world and, and so forth? And unfortunately, we didn't have time to explore it further because, you know, Bart had only 10 minutes to cross-examine me and I couldn't in fairness, chew up all of his time. Right. Um, I need to ask him, let him ask me multiple questions. Um, but it, a lot of people were very interested in that hypothesis after the debate. And so I wrote an article on it that you can find. In fact, I before the debate, I wrote a whole bunch of articles to deal with the different objections that Bart commonly brings up in these debates, because I knew there'd be no way I could answer everything in detail. And so um, if you go to jimmyakin.com slash Bart, so jimmyakin.com slash Bart, you'll find all these resources, including um, uh, the newly written one where I show the evidence for why Joseph had two, two residences and why that's not at all uncommon, even among lower class people. In fact, in some parts of the world, especially among lower class people, they will have two homes because they have a family home where they, you know, were born or raised, and then they have to migrate in order to get work. And wherever you migrate, you got to sleep somewhere. So you end up with a second secondary residence. And and you made a good point in the debate. You made an offhand comment. You said, well, they wouldn't be palatial. You know, you wouldn't have these two, you know, and it's hard because when we think today of homes, they're, they're, quite expensive because of regulations and other things requiring them to be a certain way. Whereas in the ancient world, many homes were a bit more makeshift and would be more occupied. And so it would make, that makes sense to me that like, if you are someone who is a migrant or a worker itinerant and you travel, especially if you have two separate areas, you have family somewhere and you're right. We see this today among migrants, like maybe they'll go to an agricultural community for work 
and there's another home there, but they share it with other people. It's like a kind of flop house. That way they have a roof over their head when they're working. Then they make their wages and they come back to their family. So I agree with you. And some people were kind of, oh, two homes. I'm like, well, you got to stop and think things through a little bit. When people work and travel and live, they just need a roof over their heads. And it makes sense people would work together to do that. Well, uh, and in addition, uh, now Joseph wasn't necessarily per se what we would think of as a migrant, but I do think he moved from Bethlehem to Nazareth for work. Um, like a commuter. Well, not a, like a, I think he was in Nazareth on a regular basis. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, I, we don't, I mean, he may have gone a few miles over to Sephora or something to do a contracting job, but he, he I think he was principally before in the period immediately before Jesus' birth, he was principally living in Nazareth and only Mm -hmm. maybe made short journeys to do different day jobs. Um, But people also, when they think of two homes, um, they're thinking in terms of the way people end up, the way rich people buy two homes today, which is they take out mortgages on both of them. And so they're paying a mortgage every month on two different properties. And of course that requires money, but that's not the way uh, this would have worked because Joseph would have inherited the property in Bethlehem. So that would have already been paid for. And the, I don't, as far as I know, they didn't really have mortgages in on, on real estate in first century Palestine. You just, right paid the money up front. Um, but I, I realized in writing the article, and I talk about this, that this actually reflects my situation. Because I, I was born in Texas, my parents moved to Arkansas for work. And then when I became a professional Catholic apologist, I had to move to California for work because mm-hmm. Catholic Answers didn't have a branch office in Arkansas. So, um, so I moved out to California and then later when my parents passed, I inherited their property. Mm. And so I, here I am in California, I've got a residence here, but I also have a residence back in Arkansas that I got free of charge because it was an inherited property. I didn't have to take out a mortgage on it. The mortgage was already paid. Right. And so I only needed the one income to support my California residence. And I had this other property that I was co-owner with my siblings and, um, and, and it's quite economically feasible for people to have more than one residence. Um, the second one could be rental. They could be flopping with someone or staying free of charge, or they may have the resources to purchase something modest for their second residence, but it's not at all implausible. And it actually happens loads today. Let's move to then the other the source of the contradictions that this is one that Ehrman is very famous for. And a lot of atheists will bring up claiming there are contradictions in the resurrection appearances. And so that is why the gospels are unreliable. But I do think in in this case, like he tried to bring up examples like, yeah, you get New York city in general, right. But then you get all these other major facts wrong. I don't think that's what's happening in the gospels though. The, the differences that are picked are all quite minor. It's not like one gospel says Jesus was crucified in Jerusalem and another one says he was crucified in Ephesus or something like that. Um, Now, I think that it's a lot of mountains out of molehills, and you'll probably get into this more, about how we understand the different resurrection appearances and why we need to be careful. Many of the alleged contradictions, I think, not just here, but in the infancy narratives or other places, I think they only arise because we impose upon the text our assumptions about what happened based on you know, what we heard in Sunday school, things like that. And we actually don't let the text tell us the more simpler thing that might have happened. So maybe we can move to the resurrection appearances and sure. the allegation of contradictions there. So one of the things that Bart will commonly point out is that we don't have resurrection appearances in Mark because of the way Mark ends. Um, the and there's a debate about why Mark ends that way. Some people think that um, that uh, that the in, original ending of Mark was lost and had to be replaced. Um, others think that Mark wanted to end his gospel on this in this kind of avant-garde way, where the women hear that Jesus is raised and then they rush out of the tomb and they're terrified and they don't tell anybody the end. And so the question from a really kind of postmodern view is, so Mark is asking the audience, what are you going to do? Are you going to tell anybody about Jesus? And I think that's a little too clever by half. I actually think that um, Mark is a known form of 
ancient literature called Hippomnemata, which is a, basically a collection of notes that were not in final polished literary form. They were meant as a background document to help other people write about Jesus. And, and so they're not meant to be complete. And that would also explain, you know, Mark's literary style not being as, uh, as, as polished as Luke or Matthew, because Luke and Matthew used the hypomnemata Mark produced, but then they did what they were supposed to with them, which was polish them and complete them. Yeah, when you're, re- when you're reading Mark, uh, for people who are listening, when you read the Gospel of Mark, notice how many times it starts with the conjunction and. It feels mm-hmm. very run on when you go through Mark, and this happened. Oh, and this happened, and this happened too. It's more, it's very string of pearls in its construction. Mm -hmm. It also, look for the word immediately. because Euthus, yes. (laughs) Euthus, yeah, in Greek. Mark is like, that's his pet word. He uses immediately all the time. And then it gets dropped in Matthew and Luke because it's repetitive. Um, But Bart will point out in Matthew, the disciples go to Galilee, to see Jesus, and um, and in Luke they stay in Jerusalem and see Jesus. And in fact, in Luke, uh, Jesus tells them not to leave Jerusalem. So he'll say, "Well, which was it? Where did they see Jesus in Galilee or in Jerusalem?" And I said, "Both. This is uh, he, he he saw they saw him in both places, and that's confirmed by the Gospel of John." Because if you look in John 20, immediately after the resurrection, he appears to them in Jerusalem more than once. And then in John 21, he appears to them in Galilee. And so you have um, you have Johannine, or John-based, confirmation that, yeah, it was both places. And Matthew simply chooses to focus on the Galilee appearances, whereas Luke chooses to focus on the Jerusalem appearances. Well, what do you do with, I think Ehrman was really adamant in the debate that um, Luke was saying that all of these events in his resurrection appearance narrative took place in a single day. And that would seem to contradict Matthew on that. Yeah. So this is a point where um, in the debate where Bart and I were a little bit stymied with each other because our memories of the passage were different. Um, he he said that he had, it, like an hour before the debate, looked it up to make sure he was right. And so he's talking about uh, resurrection appearances that occur in Luke 24. Mm-hmm. And, and he's right that the account of what's happening in Luke 24 starts on the day of the resurrection. It starts on the first day of the week or Sunday. And then as we proceed through the events, like the road to the encounter on the road to Emmaus, we have these timestamps in Luke saying, and that same day this happened and so forth. And as you, you work your way down, the timestamps become more vague and eventually drop out. And Luke, they drop out, for example, by verse 45. Um, and but Bart would say, well, look, all, and did say, look, all these are all time stamped as occurring on this day. And, um, and Jesus says, stay in Jerusalem. And so he's telling them this day, stay in Jerusalem and do that until after Pentecost. So they would never have gone to Galilee. Um, but I, I, my memory of the passage, which I subsequently verified, is that that's Luke does not give us that same day all the way through. He does vary it. He does vary the time cues he's using, and they become vaguer. And after um, a certain point, they're so vague that you can't say Luke is claiming this all happened that day anymore. In fact, um, just before the command to stay in Jerusalem, because the alternative theory that that I was advocating is, well, they saw Jesus in Jerusalem, and then they went and they saw him in Galilee, and then at some point they're back in Jerusalem getting ready for Pentecost, and Jesus tells, because you're supposed to go to Jerusalem for Pentecost, so they're back down there again, and it's at that point Jesus says, stay in the city until you've received the Holy Spirit. Mm. And so that would be one of the last things that Jesus would have told them over this 40-day period that Luke describes uh, at the beginning of Acts. Um, but if you if you look late in Luke 24, Luke even at one point uses the term tote, which in Greek, it means then or thereafter. So it could mean either at that time or after 
that time. Mm-hmm. He said, stay in Jerusalem. And that's the last thing bef- that Jesus says in Luke 24 before the ascension. Mm. So, um, so that would tell us that around the ascension, they were in the Jerusalem area. And that's, and at least the way Luke 24 reads, that's when he gave them this command. It was 10 days before Pentecost, not the day of the resurrection. How helpful is it for us to, in trying to explain these um, alleged contradictions, to talk about rhetorical devices and ways of the evangelist describing uh, details and allowing them to vary? Because I, I think one quick way when I would, if I talked about this with someone, <clears throat> is I might say that Luke is using a narrative device called telescoping, you mm-hmm. know, where when, as you describe events, um, you make it seem like they're all in a specific period that they are, you make it seem like they are closer together than they really are for your narrative uniformity, just like how a telescope makes something seem closer than it really is. And your point is, is just to do that without providing strict chronology. Is that helpful to talk about these rhetorical devices? Yeah, that's what I largely did during my uh, rebuttal period, during my second statement. I, I wanted to give people tools, you know, intellectual tools for evaluating the kind of claims that, that people will make when they charge the Gospels with error. And so I, in, in the original draft of my second statement, I talked about four uh, literary uh, practices that were used by ancient writers. Selection which means choosing to include some material and some details over rather than others that you could have mentioned. Um, paraphrase, which is communicating the same meaning. It's what someone said, but in different words. Um, and, um, and sequencing, uh, which is do you choose to sequence your material in chronological order or in some other kind of order, like topical order? where you put material on the same topic together, even though it may have occurred in different periods. And then I also, the fourth one was going to be telescoping, where you um, where you compress stuff in a way, like, for example, when you say Solomon built the temple, you don't mean he personally picked up a hammer. You know, there were workmen who built the temple, but it was on Solomon's behalf. And so you just omit the workmen and talk about Solomon. Yeah. Or because like he was we the say principal that, agent. like we say, Pilate flogged Jesus. He didn't do it himself. I'm sorry. What was it's that? Like, it's like if we say Pilate flogged Jesus. It, he sure. He didn't Same do it thing. himself. Yeah. Yeah. That's also telescoping. Unfortunately, my statement was running a little too long, so I had to cut the telescoping. But, um, but I agree. I think what's happening in Luke 24 is we have a topical ordering. I think that's the, the main literary practice that's happening here. Um, he is selecting resurrection accounts that he knows occurred over this 40-day period, or resurrection appearance accounts that he knows occurred over this 40-day period, and he's putting them all together in chapter 24. Uh, mm-hmm. Because they're all on the same topic. They're all resurrection appearances. And he does have time cues telling us when some of them happened. But I think that um, that if you read carefully, you'll see the time cues eventually drop out. Mm-hmm. And at a certain point, you know, like when he says, and Jesus said. Well, anytime you've got and Jesus said, you don't know when that happened. It just means he said it at some point. Right. But that by reintroducing the and Jesus said, that tells you it's a separate saying than the one you were just reading. So there's a break in the sayings, and he doesn't tell you when he, when the new saying is was given. It could have been some other time. Okay. Um, overall, wrapping up talking about the debate, then I want to ask mm-hmm. you about encountering gospel difficulties in general. Uh-huh. Um, how, how do you think overall it went? Um, just your, your thoughts now that, now that it's over and you got to engage uh, Ehrman. Well, I was very pleased with it. Um, I think that the the fundamental strategy that I used of let's focus on common ground, what even Bard agrees with, uh, I think that was I think that was very effective for people. I mean, of course, you know, debates usually don't change people's minds, mm-hmm. um, but I think in terms of um, of 
how the strategy worked. I think it worked very well. Um, I think I was able to improve on what I've seen other debaters uh, do with Bart on this subject. Um, I also met a couple of other goals, which I was determined to do. Uh, one of them was to be super friendly to Bart and to just be as nice as I possibly could. You know, I still had a little good natured kidding in there, but I, I really tried to be, you know, consistently friendly and um, and I even had pre-planned things that I was going to do. Uh, like at one point I was talking about the fact that Bart has written a whole book on um, on the existence of Jesus, where right. he refutes Jesus mythicists. And so I said, he deserves credit for that. Let's all give him a big round of applause. And people did. Um, and then I said, and you know, Bart and I agree on this. And I walked over to him because we weren't very far apart on the stage. And I said, Jesus exists. High five. And he gave me a high five. And as far as I know, I'm, I'm the only person ever to high five Bart during a debate. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, it was another, uh, trying to be nice. Uh, I think I that's, really... that's very important. Yeah. You, I mean, debates yeah. are not just arguments. Right. And so I wanted to set a positive tone, uh, both to be nice to Bart and to show the audience that, you know, I'm not some mean spirited fundamentalist, whatever. I don't fit that stereotype. I'm, right. I'm trying to be a genial guy. Um, and also I wanted to, uh, project confidence. Uh, mm. in under uh, in cross examination, because I s in, in other debates I would see people, even people who are really brilliant scholars, they may not be debaters, and Bart would get them rattled, yeah, and they would project a lack of confidence, and I wanted to project confidence, and so even though you know Bart and I disagreed, and the temperature went up slightly during uh, some of the cross examination, um, it. I, I still think I came was able to come across as confident in the answers I'm giving. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about uh, gospel contradictions in general. Uh, what would be your advice then for Christians who are, or, you know, you're reading the gospels and you come across these, these differences and maybe you feel rattled a bit about it. What do you think is a general strategy and then some resources you would recommend? So, um, as far as a general strategy, I would recognize that the that we have to read the Gospels as the kind of literature they are. They are not written by the same rules that we use today when we are writing literature. Um, in the ancient world, and this deals with the, um, the practices that I brought up in the ancient literary practices that I brought up in my second statement, like a paraphrase. Because in the ancient world, people did not have tape recorders or video recorders, and as a result, they usually did not have exact transcripts of what someone had said. And so the ancient audiences knew that. They knew that an author didn't have an exact transcript in front of him, and so he wasn't giving you the exact words that someone used necessarily, but he is trying to give you the gist of what someone said. In other words, he's paraphrasing. He's giving you the same basic meaning, but in different words. And so um, when you recognize that, it'll solve a bunch of the uh, you know, supposed contradictions that some people might bring up. Now, Bart was not one of these people. Bart acknowledges that paraphrase does not result in contradiction. Um, but there are people who will say that. So like here, Jesus uses this word, but in this other gospel, Jesus uses a, another word that has the same meaning, but it's different. So it's a contradiction. Well, no, it's not. That's just paraphrase. Right. Uh, same thing with selection. Um, the, and I wish I'd had time, but to explain this a little further in the debate, but my, uh, uh, but I didn't, uh, so I had to cut this. But in the ancient world, because books had to be copied by hand and every piece of paper had to be made by hand, they didn't have machines making papyrus you right. know, or parchment. They had that all had to be handmade. Um, books were fantastically expensive. A single copy just one copy of the Gospel of Matthew would cost a, around $2,000. And so uh, the equivalent of $2,000. And so there was enormous price pressure for authors to keep their books short. And that means they had, I mean, if you spent three years with Jesus, you'd have all kinds of stories you could tell. But you need to fit them into that one $2,000 scroll. So you've got to leave out a lot of material. 
And so uh, different authors make different choices. They make different selections of the material they're going to include. So, for example, uh, if you read Mark, you'll find an account where Jesus heals a blind man, and he only mentions the one blind man. But if you read Matthew, oh, there were actually two on that occasion. And I've seen people say, oh, that's a contradiction. Well, no, it's not. And Bart would agree that it's not. That's just right. a difference of what are they what are they selecting for inclusion. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we mentioned telescoping uh, as another liter- literary device that's used, and also topical sequencing rather than chronological sequencing. All of those are, as you become aware of these literary devices, you understand what you can and cannot expect from the Gospels. Um, You cannot expect them to be written according to modern rules, um, but you can expect them to communicate the gist of what happened, which you can recognize once you know these different rules and can say, okay, well, this is an example of selection difference. This is an example of paraphrasing. This is an example of sequencing uh, topically rather than chronologically, and so forth. Um, in terms of resources, well, you oh, got a book on this. Yes. Well, before we get to the resources, mm-hmm. is it also important for people to know, think about what they do agree on mm-hmm. and how important is that? Like if they all agree, yeah. basic life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, well, we have a firm foundation there on what they all agree on, that what there's disagreement shouldn't frighten us as much. Yeah, um, I, I would certainly agree with that. And then yeah, so the yeah, so, the, uh, yeah. so yeah, I do so, have my book, Hard Sayings. Uh, and you've right. got some other stuff. I, I have uh, uh, a daily defense, which includes a lot of material. It's a three hundred sixty-five day book, so you, it's like one page a day. Although you can binge read, and most people do because it's so compelling. Um, <laughs> but I take on lots of alleged contradictions and resolve them in less than a page. Um, also, I uh, taught uh, a Bible Difficulties course for the Catholic Answer School of Apologetics. It's called Bible Difficulties 1. It's the first in a series, and it's already available, so you can check that out. All right, very good. I would also definitely recommend a um, resource on this, The Historical Reliability of the Gospels by Craig Blumberg. He also mm-hmm. has one on John. That's, a, that's another he's, good resource. And he's got a New Testament one now that covers the whole thing, if I'm not mistaken. Good stuff. All right. Well, Jimmy, uh, thank you so much. And then also definitely recommend people check out Jimmy's website, jimmyakin.com and his podcast, Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World. So Jimmy, thanks for being here today. My pleasure. All right. Thank you so much. And thank you guys for watching. And I hope that you all have a very blessed day. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you want to help us produce more great content like this, be sure to click subscribe and go to trenthornpodcast.com to become a premium subscriber. You'll help us create more videos like this and get access to bonus content and sneak peeks of our upcoming projects.